they chose to follow God. The idea of faith is simply this. Faith is this, this simple thing. It is obedient. It's a confident obedience. God calls you. It's a confident obedience. And so we're looking at that because, again, in our current moment that we're living in, it is so important for us to live as a people of faith. And so, but what I want to do, because this has happened in every service, and I have felt like this for every service, I know that when you walk out of here, like, there's a lot that you're facing. Like, you've got something. Like, I felt that so strongly. I'm not just saying like, that there's stuff that's out there for you. You've got a lot that you've got to deal with. But what I want us to do is try to suspend that for a moment, okay? I want us to suspend that for a moment, and I want us to see if we can just take a moment right now that where we can lock in and actually hear from God, because I believe he has something to say. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes, and what I want you to do is just whatever that thing is that you're dealing with out there, is you simply would say, God, I trust you. Whatever that thing is, whatever that thing is that's waiting for you out there, is that's what you would say, God, I trust you. Father, would you help us in these moments? We say, come Holy Spirit, reveal God the Father, reveal Jesus the Son. We love you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I want you to visualize something for me. I want you to visualize that if I told you, you can live anywhere you want to. Now, put no caveats on it, okay? Like a lot of y'all put way too many caveats even on an imaginary conversation. Well, I couldn't do this. I got responsibilities. I'm like, dog, right, right now you got none, okay? So whatever. Think about that. I mean, Miami, L.A., Lake Como, Southern Andalusia, Spain, Tokyo, wherever, wherever, Tallahassee. I know some of y'all students are like, oh, no, <laughs> whatever, all right? So whatever that place is, I want you to visualize that place. I want you to try to, like for me, like I think about like Washington, D.C. Like I love Washington, D.C. I was just there last week. Like, but I want you to just visualize a place that you could, you could be, and maybe it's the smell of like the, the, the salt from the water. Maybe it's the sun on your skin, whatever. I want you to try to visualize that. What I also want you to do is now, as you think about that place, I want you to imagine that everything is taken care of. You have no financial worries. I know some of you right now, like even the imaginary of that just made your shoulders drop. You're like, oh God, yeah, who? <laughs> right? Like, just know where, like you're, like you're, like you're taken care of. Like your your day to day bills, all stuff is taken care of. Okay. Now, on top of that, what I want you to think about is that let's just say, like your your future is taken care of as well. That someone has, that somebody's literally going to give you an inheritance, so your retirement is taken care of. Now, I want you to think about how you, how like, how does that make you feel? Like, do you feel relief? Is there excitement? Some of you are like sad because you're like, God, I wish this wasn't imaginary. I wish this was real. So now you're in your city and you're also on top of that, your money, possessions are fine. The next thing I want you to think about is this, that your people are with you. Now, your family's with you. Now, I know some of you, I just ruined it. Okay. I said your family, like, all right, well, we went from this, a dream to a nightmare. But let's just say, like, the family dynamic, right, is functioning. It's, it's, it's working. But also, I want you to think about your friends. I want you to think about those people, like, you know, you would do a game night with, somebody you go on a date night with, you go to happy hour with, whatever. Like, I want you to think about those people, people you go on vacation with. Like, I think about that, I get really excited. Like, I go with my best friends every year. We go on a trip. And so we're going in a couple months. And, like, and I'm, like, right now, like, super excited to actually go. Like, so I'm thinking about, like, I actually live, like, we lived in the same place together. That's our dream, all of us. Like, my three best friends, our dream is to live, like, in the same place together. But, like, just imagine that, you're, like that's there and just, and just the, 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 the excitement of that and the fun of that and just all the stuff it's the people who you hang out with who get you already like you don't have to explain everything's already explained they get like you you like anime and, and like and you know they may think you're weird or you know or, or you're somebody that you like going to you know that you, you, you love certain clothing or, or you know they, they know that you got a dry sense of humor sometimes they know you're super sarcastic and they just kind of deal with you you know what I'm saying like those friends right those friends like those friends you actually really really rock with I want you to think about that. Now, here's the last thing I want you to think about. I want you to think about as well that in this city that you live in, with all the money that you got and with all your friends, you actually have influence. You have a lot of influence. Like your name carries weight. 
Like you can go, you can call somebody, you can get to this place, you can get to that place, you can do this thing. Like your name moves weight. I mean, you got the ability to do those things. I want you to imagine all of that that's going on. And, and now just think about how you would feel if you, you're, you have a name, you have this, you have power, you have influence, you have your friends, you have all your possessions taken care of. And, and now here's the deal. I want you to imagine you've lived there now for a period of time now. You've now lived there for a period of time, so you're settled there. You're comfortable there. You know the ways around. Like, you're so comfortable there, you know, like, Tallahassee to not go on Tennessee Street when students get back here, okay? Like, that's how much you know the city. You know your way around it. You've been living there for a long time. Now, here's the deal. I want you to imagine, I want you to think about this, how God would show up right now. And again, for some of you, this is going to trip you out, that God shows up. Now, how would God speak to you? Because some of y'all, you question, does God speak to you? Because the reason why you question it is because you're expecting God to speak to you in a certain way. Some of y'all are like, man, if I just had a burning bush or an angel. Have you ever seen an angel described in the Bible? That's not what I want to see. But however you feel like God, you knew it was God. And here's what happens. He shows up to you and he says, I need you to leave all that. Yep, Right. I need you to leave all that because I got something better for you. How would you feel? I'll tell you how I felt because I did this exercise with myself this week. And I had a 30-minute argument with God on an imaginary situation. This is a true story. Because all of a sudden, I started asking God, I'm like, why? Dog, like, I'm calm. I'm like, dog, this is amazing. What do you mean something better? I don't need anything better. I am good. Like, this is like better. Like, God, I, I know you say it's better, but I am fine. Why would you do this? Why is it God? I mean, I'm literally, so like what was coming out of me in that moment was some of my own like kind of personal issues with God that I've had to wrestle with. I'm like, God, why is it when I get settled and I feel good, then all of a sudden you got to tell me to go somewhere else? And my heart rate's getting up. I'm getting mad on an imaginary conversation. Y'all. I'm not, this is a true story. I am frustrated. But I want you to know, in all of that, this was really the life of Abraham, the father of our faith. Genesis 12 tells us this. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into the household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abraham traveled through the land far as Shem. This is the word of the Lord. Now, you have to understand, Abraham had lived in this place called Ur, and, and Abraham Ur ultimately ends up being what we learn to know as Babylon, that Abraham lived in Babylon. Fun Bible fact is that whenever the people of Israel would be disobedient to God, starting with our first parents, that God would always send them toward Babylon, and then when God would deliver them, he would send them back toward the garden. But, like, they're now in Babylon, and so Abraham, he's telling him to leave, and so, like, I... Like, I get it, because Abraham, like, he's there, and he's lived there for 75 years, and he's settled there. He knows the city. He knows the favorite place to get, like, whatever Abraham, if he drank tea or he ate pizza or whatever it was back then, like, he knew where to go. He knew the shop to go to get his hair cut. Like, he was very comfortable with the city that he was actually living in, and God shows up to him and tells him, listen, all those things, I need you to leave. And here's the thing. You built your wealth during that time based off your livestock and what was passed down to you. And God says, listen, you can keep the stuff you've made, but your family and everything else, you got to leave all that. So that inheritance and everything, you have to leave that. And Abraham, I got something better for you. I'm talking about much better for you. You, But you got to trust me. You have to leave this. And again, I've read this for so many years. I've preached this for so many years. But the one thing I've been thinking about over the last several weeks about this passage is this. The thing I've never thought about was the disruption to Abraham's lifestyle. I just was like, yeah, it's hard. You're leaving this stuff. But Abraham's entire lifestyle was about to change. Like everything that he knew, how he moved, 
how he lived was about to change because listen, for 75 years, he lived in a city. He was settled. He knew the process of what he was doing. And now God was getting ready to ask a man to leave that to go to a different place. He was getting ready to ask this man to go and to live a different lifestyle. And here's what I want us to know. The struggle that most people have in faith is actually changing their lifestyle. What we tend to do is we want to add God to our lifestyle instead of allowing God to predict and now tell us our lifestyle. And we just add God as an add on. And I've seen it. I don't care if you're trying to figure out faith or you've been serving God for 20 years. This is the fight of the human soul is to do what? It's to settle and have whatever lifestyle I want. And God, I want you to be okay with that. But a life of faith is a life to live in a completely different way. Because here's the thing about spiritually. God does not want us to be in a place of being settled. Now, listen, he wants to bring us peace. And when I say settle, I'm not talking about anxiety and all that or or not or having anxiety when I say move. What he wants us to do is never be complacent with where we're at. He's always wanting us to go from glory to glory. And some of you just want to park on the revelation he gave you five years ago. But we find out a little bit more what he was called to in the book of Hebrews. It says this, All these people, this is talking about Abraham and the first family, died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads. I want you to remember that, foreigners and nomads here on the earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So what God says to Abraham is this, you now, if you're going to accept this, because Abraham had the choice, he gave him a call, but he had a choice, but he answered that call. But he said, you're no longer going to live as a settler in this land. You're no longer going to be living in a place where you know where everything's at, Abraham, but you're going to be a wanderer. You're no longer going to have a homeland, Abraham, but you're going to be a nomad. Now, to understand this about a nomad, it was this. They were groups of people, especially in 18th century B.C., who lived in tents. They were people who had to find land for their cattle and their livestock and fresh water. Like, it was like they call, it's like going to a city, you know what I'm saying? And you've got to check in, right? So whenever you'd be a nomad, you have to check in with wherever you're going because somebody sees you coming, they may not like you. So you had to be savvy as a leader as well. And nomads would go, but they lived in a way where they could pack up and move to the next place. And God was telling Abraham, if you decide to follow me, I got something great for you, but you will never live in a place where you're settled in a land again. Why is this, why does this matter? It's because Abraham's life is a life to show us how actually the spiritual life works. Is that God, though we settle in cities, God is always growing and moving us in faith. But what our tendency is, is not to want to do that. Our human condition is we just want to settle. We just want to settle. To live as a nomad, 1 Peter tells us, 1 Peter 2.11 tells us this. It says that we live as aliens and strangers here. We live as nomads in this world. But that's hard because it seems contradictory because the Bible tells us in in Jeremiah that he tells us to pray for the city and bless the city and plant vineyards and, and care for the city, prosper, you prosper. God, you want us to settle, but then you're saying we're nomads. What is it? And the answer is yes. He wants you to be settled, but he also wants you to constantly spiritually be growing. So here's the question I have for you. Like, when it comes to faith, like, is your faith just about you being settled? Because, like, here's the truth for me. If I, I'll be really honest with you. A lot of times my faith, it ends up being about my comfort. If I'm honest, and let me tell you this, and I'm going to say this all, most of everyone in this room, that's it. I'll, I'll explain very quick. I've got three kids, three teenagers. One adult, two teenagers. Now, it's crazy. Here you go. You know what I used to always pray for? I still want no drama. Like, that literally, that's my prayer. God, we have no drama today. If you are a parent, that is the most worthless prayer. 
in the history of the world that we keep sowing up in faith. We keep sowing it every day. God just, God, can they just please, I just can't, everybody be okay today. And the truth is, no, no, they're never okay. Here's what I realized. It wasn't me praying this because I want them to, yes, I want my kids to be okay and I want them to not have to be stirred up by stuff, but deep inside, I don't want to deal with drama. So my prayer in faith was about my comfort, not about the betterment at times of my children. That doesn't mean I don't love my children. That just means at times the motivation of my faith and my prayer was not about that. It was about, can I just get to a place where there's just no drama? So when you think about your prayers, I want you to ask yourself the motivation behind them. And normally, it's about what? Us. Our success. Our impact. And we'll throw other people in there. Like, we will. Like, y'all are good people. You know what I'm saying? Like, y'all are good people. Everybody, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. God bless me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I shine, we shine. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the motto. <laughs> but over a long time of serving God... Spiritually, I get why we have to live as nomads. Because the more comfortable I get, the more faith I begin to depend on myself and not him. I begin to trust myself way more than I trust him. So here's the one question I ask for you today. This is the point today. What is behind your faith? What is the reason behind your faith? Why do you show up? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible if you do? Why do you go to Nehemiah? Why do you serve on the team if you're in here? Like, why do you try to raise your kids this way? Why? Because that one thing is the most important thing you can ask because the motivations matter. And that is what God was getting to and that is why Abraham was called this. He's called the father of our faith because they lived and they moved a little bit different because Abraham was promised. This is what trips me out about the Bible. It said that Abraham was promised a thing. Abraham didn't get the thing. But it said he still believed for it, even though he didn't see it. God does not show up in two days for you like Amazon Prime and you're pissed off at him. <laughs> well, God, I prayed for this. And the Bible says that the prayer of a righteous man, I heard Pastor Adrian say the prayer of a righteous man, powerful and effective. I'm righteous because I'm in Christ now. So you should answer my prayers just like you answer Jesus' prayers. Last time I checked, Jesus was in the garden praying, God, take this cup away from me. But he still made him get, he made him get crucified. The point is this, what happens in faith is this moment. We spend so much time thinking about the stuff out here. We're more addicted to the destination than we actually are the process of faith. Faith is about the process. It's not about the destination. We think faith is about, I'm believing, I get. I'm believing, I get this. And so you'll start praying for this thing. And if I'm praying for this thing out here and I get this thing out here, that means I have faith. And if I don't get this thing out here, that means I, my faith is wrong, God's wrong or whatever. But God's saying this, it's not about the destination, it's about the process. And that is the hardest part of faith. Remember, this confident obedience because what we will do is our reason behind our faith is to get the stuff versus to get the one who actually provides the stuff. That is why if I told you right now, whatever that dream place you had in your mind, you can have it or you can have God. Which one would you take? I know everyone in this room right now, I would take God. The reason why I'm asking this question 
is because I think what's been lost and where the world's going is we have, we've lost the ability to think deeply about faith and about Christianity and Jesus. What we do is we believe a lot of Christian platitudes. We say a lot of Christian language. Some of you in here are followers of Jesus. You say this stuff, but you have no idea what the meaning of that stuff is. You have no idea why you actually believe what you actually believe. And, and, and then when you pray, you never stop to say, why am I praying this? Why am I asking God for this? Am I asking God just for my own comfort? Am I asking God for just a life where I just can feel okay? And, or am I asking God for God that I just want to be more like you? And listen, when God, this is what I've realized with God, right when I get settled, he's saying, I got something else for you. And that's frustrating to me because I'm like, yo, I'm fine right now. Don't we finally figured it out. Your boy was an idiot for like 15 years. And I feel like I'm like, I got, I, I feel like I got it now. And right when I feel like I'm settled, God shows up. Next level. <laughs> And when he takes it to the next level, it's not all bad stuff all the time. Like, I'm in a part of my life right now where it's not about bad stuff. I mean, I, I, like, let me just tell you this. This is just free game for all you here who are younger. Your, the rest of life is this, dreams and nightmares. Meat Mill was a prophet. Here's the deal. <laughs> life is sandwiched between dreams and nightmares. All of y'all want dreams your whole life, but life is sandwiched between dreams and nightmares. You will experience nightmares and dreams the rest of your life. Now, my point though right now, it's things that God promised years ago that actually I'm walking into and here's what I'm starting to realize. The faith it takes to walk into that because it's way larger, it's the unknown and I've got to let certain things go that I don't want to. Because why? I'm a control freak deep at heart and I know how to control this. Because in this moment, that, that plays on the broken parts of me. It plays on the broken parts of humanity. We love control because deep inside, we just want to be God. And what God does in these moments is beat it out of me. So what is that for you? Why do you actually want your marriage to be better? Why do you actually want to be married? Some of y'all here, why do you want to be married? Most of y'all want to be married so you don't feel like the insecure person, that like you don't want to be the insecure person that don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm in my single season again. <laughs> and you're just doing it for Instagram and actually instead of doing it for anything that has any bit of substance in your life. Why? Like, I don't think sometimes people know, like when you're getting married, listen, I literally love my wife. And she will say this, marriage is hard. It is two broken people, like selfish, imperfect, chasing a perfect God and just stumbling your way through life. Just holding each other's hand, trying not to die. That's pretty much it. <laughs> and here's the deal. And you know what? I'm way more like Jesus than I was. I'm way more like Jesus if I wasn't with her. Because why? Iron sharpens iron. But here's the thing. But why do you want that? Or you just want that for your Instagram caption and pictures. Like, stop. Stop being so freaking shallow. Think about it. Why do we want more money? Why do we want more success? Why do you want to move to this city? Why? Just because now you can go to places and eat at cool places and go do things. And all of a sudden, after all of that, you feel better about yourself. But yet and still, there's of no eternal value. Let me tell you this. At 45 years of age, the most important thing that I am thinking about is will there be a long shadow of faith in my life that those who come behind me can walk underneath it? I am sitting at the African-American History Museum and I am at the bottom floor of it and I am overwhelmed because why? Because there were men and women who by faith believed in the midst of outright suffering and still trusted Jesus so that I could walk into it. I am a descendant of slaves, generations who serve God and I am the answer to their prayers. So who the heck am I after all that suffering that I'm gonna live my life for myself? Some of you, listen, some of you need to understand this. 
you are walking into what you're walking into is because you had people before you praying for you. Amen. You are riding their wave. You ain't that good. I need y'all to understand this. I am riding the wave. I am riding the wave of ancestors who I know prayed for me. And I'm riding that wave. So who the heck now? You know what I'm doing? I am praying for the next generation. Why? Because that's the kingdom. And you guys sometimes think, and sometimes I think the kingdom is about me. It's not. It is about a life of faith, and you have to go from place to place. And let me tell you, it's hard. And here's the point. What's behind your face? See, when you look at Abraham, here's what the most, it says this. It says at the end of that verse we read, and I think it's verse 16, it says that God was unashamed. They were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That's why God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Now, we don't have anything in recorded scripture that says where God told Abraham about heaven. What we can assume is because we get the highlights that there was other times that God talked to Abraham. But here's what it says. It says that Abraham, and this is the main point, that it was not about the promised land. It was about the one who was going to be there. It was about the one who was going to walk with them. Abraham, the, what was behind his faith wasn't that he was going to get this great nation. It wasn't because he's going to get this great piece of land. It was the fact that God was going to be with him. That is why Moses says, I don't want to go anywhere unless your presence goes with us. See, what they were longing for was not the stuff they were longing for him. See, a life of faith is longing to be with him, to know him, to spend time with him, to have this intimate relationship with him. It's about him. It's not about the stuff. And so if anything is behind your faith, then that, what will begin to happen, the, the motivation, the stuff will become the thing you worship and not him. That's why they could walk and say, they didn't see it. Listen, they were walking and it said they saw it from a distance. They didn't even get to see the promised land, but they welcomed it. But they were like, they were looking past that. That's okay. That promised land is going to be great. Flowing with milk and honey, all that. But there's a heavenly place when he comes back with new heavens and new earth. That's something way better. So I'm going to remain faithful regardless of the suffering in my body because there's something greater coming. See, that's what you have to understand. Like those in here who are younger, I need you to understand this. In the future, I really believe this, that many of you, you're going to face persecution for your faith. And here's what you have to start preparing your life for is this. Will I serve Jesus if it costs me something? If it costs you pain, if they will imprison you for your faith, if all of a sudden they will fire you because of your faith, will you remain faithful to him? Because right now you'll tap out if he doesn't give you that person. Can you imagine if all of a sudden somebody beats you for your faith? You have to think of something greater. There's something greater that's waiting. When my grandfather passed away, I was at his funeral, and, and I knew my grandfather. I mean, we were, we were decently well. And he wasn't a perfect man. But as I'm sitting there, and I have it hanging up in my office, as they have the casket there, he served. He was a pastor for over 55 years. Served in the military, so we have a flag and have his Bible. And so before they do it, I'm like, I asked my dad, like, can I have his Bible? And that night I just was looking through it. And I got so overwhelmed because I was like, this man wasn't perfect. But when I would hear him preach, he would always talk about there's something greater. 
He used to say, grandson, don't worry about the small stuff because there's something greater. Amen. And I used to always, in my young, critical nature, would be like, man, you need to have some faith for this life. And one time I told my grandfather, I was like, grandfather, all you ever talk about sometimes when you preach is heaven and this life and what's to come. I'm like, what about right now? <laughs> And he was very calm and patient with his very arrogant grandson. As a man who pastored in Mississippi and Memphis during Jim Crow, he's like, grandson, I've seen hell. I can't wait for heaven. <laughs> and those are those moments where you're like, dang it. You're like, ugh. You can answer if it's God, okay? <laughs> um, But the older I get, the more I understand it, and I appreciate it. I'm longing for something greater than this world. Amen. And if you're younger in this room, if you can get that at a young age, it'll change your life. There's something far greater than this world. Doesn't mean you shouldn't go after stuff. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try to make impact and change. You guys know what we think. We're innovative reconcilers. We want to change every industry. We want to go for it. But when you do that, it should be something greater. And there should be something before you that you cannot accomplish in this lifetime because your faith should extend and others should ride your wave. So what's behind your faith? Father, I thank you for these people. God, help us to be a people. God, that we really do understand the motivations behind our faith, God. Let us be a people, God, who, who are willing, God, to walk, to trust, to believe. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's your practical takeaway. I want you, before you go to bed tonight, to answer that question honestly. What's behind your faith? Now, in that, be honest, it's yours. Some of y'all be lying to yourself in your own notes app. <laughs> it's your notes app. <laughs> like, stop lying. Like, you know what I'm saying? God already knows. Like, don't lie in your own notes app, all right? The truth sets you free. We're going to take a communion. If you didn't get a communion element, just lift your hands up. One of the ushers will bring it. But as we're, as we're doing, I want you guys to really focus on me because I really wanted to show you something. As we take of communion today, I'm reminded of a story.